builders so they can actually make them. With the boat, I have a very, very strong feeling that I'm in the presence of a drawing that really has, it's so much like your drawing made into a solid object. It's... Well, it was, it, this was for me one of those absolutely serendipitous things where you draw something and then it becomes the drawing. And that doesn't happen very often. And it's a real pleasure when it does. And it took a lot of work by a lot of people because the technology of making this hull so hard was very, very difficult. It's, this is aerospace laminate technology to make this carbon fiber hull. And it needs and it, to be really hard so that they can get minimum friction. So it doesn't take away any energy by being soggy as it rolls about. And then the, the whole shape of it with these very expressive handrails. This end is the face. It has a, a, tail, a bird's tail at the stern and the head here. And these handrails are like the Elvis quiff. <laughs> we're, well, we're, in, we're in Vegas. These are the positions where people do individual so, so, things. So this from. is where somebody who's going to perform, they actually start here. here. They'll come in with a harness, oh, oh, climb down. Sorry, I'll get vertigo. And then they go. And here. <laughs> Having seen all the drawings and designs, I was curious about seeing it all come to life in the evening's performance. During the show, for all the high-tech machinery involved, I was struck by how timeless this spectacle actually seemed. I felt as though I could have been watching a Baroque mask staged for a 17th century king, or an entertainment fit for a Medici prince, complete with acrobats, witches and wizards, washed with a light smattering of allegory and symbolism. This might be Vegas, but it's not that far from Renaissance Italy. And one of the things I like most about Fisher's work is its sense of history. I'd mentioned to him that his boat and flying machine reminded me of designs by Leonardo, and he'd said yes, that's exactly where they came from. no coincidence that Mark Fisher, who I think of really as a 21st century Renaissance man, should have designed the spectacle through a series of drawings. Drawings that gave him a sense of scale, a sense of perspective, a sense of human placement within the spectacle as a whole. And if I had to identify one thing that runs through the tradition of design from the Renaissance to the present day, it is that line, that line of drawing. And there's no better place to start tracing that line linking past and present than the birthplace in Italy of the original Renaissance all-rounder. Finch is still a little town in the back of beyond Smallsville, Tuscany, and it's part of the myth that's grown up around the town's most famous son, Leonardo da Vinci, that he was the genius who came from nowhere. But the truth is very different, and the fact is that Leonardo's great spreading oak tree of a mind branching out in all directions could only ever have flourished in 15th century Tuscany. Leonardo's mind was inquiring, sceptical, profoundly speculative. You can see that mentality in the fertile pages of his sketchbooks. And something else makes him very special. In the late 15th century in Italy, paper suddenly became much more plentiful, much cheaper. And Leonardo is really one of the first Renaissance men to go about the world with a notebook, jotting down his ideas, his designs. And that also means that he's the first great Western European artist designer whose imagination we can actually see at work. You can't understand Leonardo if you think of him as a pure artist in the modern sense. He created famously subtle portraits and religious paintings. But as a top court artist, he was expected to design the prince's fortifications, invent his army's weapons, 
and carry out a thousand other tasks besides. The Vinci Museum shows his scatterfire imagination at work. One minute he's inventing a diving suit, the next he's working on an armoured car. There's even a wonderfully modern looking bicycle in the reams and reams of his notebook sketches. His respect for nature as the ultimate designer is reflected in his most famous invention, that for a flying machine based on the structure of a peregrine falcon's wings. But although Leonardo took first steps in all sorts of directions, most of his ideas would be unrealizable in his lifetime. The materials, technology and engineering expertise to make them happen simply hadn't evolved. They were destined to lie dormant in the ground, acorns that sometimes wouldn't sprout for centuries. One of Leonardo's most caustic later critics described him as an intellectual libertine who wasted his life insatiate in experiment. But I think that's also what's so endearing about him. He's the great patron saint of the mad inventor, the dreamer, the adventurous, unconventional thinker. And he paved the way for centuries of speculative design. But Leonardo is only part of Renaissance Italy's legacy to the design tradition. Just as important was another Renaissance man, whose every design, by contrast, was intensely practical. Where Leonardo loved thinking outside the box, this great thinker created the rules for staying within it. Most importantly, perhaps, he recognized that in order for a drawing to become the blueprint for something real and buildable, it had to be drawn in accurate, three-dimensional perspective. Interestingly, it wasn't a painter who devised the first system for drawing in true perspective, but an architect engineer, an ingegnere, to use the Renaissance phrase, a man of ingenuity. His name was Filippo Brunelleschi, Pippo to his friends, and his claim to fame was that he designed and constructed the great dome of Florence Cathedral. But it wasn't enough for Brunelleschi to have created this architectural wonder of the world. He was determined to place the principles of rational design at the very heart of Renaissance thinking. Brunelleschi's tactic was to stage a public demonstration of his new big idea. He came to this spot to be precise, he stood three braccia, or arm's lengths, inside the door of Florence Cathedral, and he painted a picture of the baptistry opposite. The painting's lost, but it was so perspectively accurate that it changed the world of art and design forever. Such was its impact that the mathematical techniques involved were formalized, written down, and illustrated, so the secret became common knowledge. A key figure in this process was Piero della Francesca. He was born a generation after Brunelleschi and wasn't just one of the greatest artists of the early Renaissance, but also a man who realized, like his predecessor, the potential of mathematics. The story goes that he would stay up working on these obsessively diagrammatic drawings and studies all night. And when his wife called him to come to bed, Piero would just call out that he was spending the night with his mistress, Lady Perspective. The technique's appeal to painters was obvious, but its importance for designers and architects, for people whose drawings had to be actually made into real things, was even greater. I think of the design tradition, especially in architecture, as having a bit of a split personality. On the one hand, there are the Brunelleschis and the Christopher Wrens of this world, the men who get it done, who build the great domes and other city landmarks, even the cities themselves. But just as important are the Leonardos, more impractical perhaps, but vital as catalysts 
seeding the ideas and designs that will one day shape the future. I went to meet Charles Hind, curator of drawings at the Royal Institute of British Architects at the v and Architectural Gallery, a treasure trove both of practical architectural drawings and fantasy projects. Its collections span the built, the yet to be built, and the just plain unbuildable. We've got the majority of Palladio's surviving drawings. Oh wow, that's fantastic. The drawings were a much more valuable resource because they do show more than um, just a sort of design record of buildings as built, but they do show him working ideas. They show through. you how to do it. They show you how to do it. Palladio was the leading practical architect of Renaissance Venice, the Venetian equivalent to Brunelleschi, if you like. His great achievement was to apply the language of classical architecture, revived during the early Renaissance, to the domestic house, specifically the villa. This is just one of a whole series of Palladio drawings, which collectively transformed not just Italian, but also British architecture. Brought here in the time of Charles I, they inspired generations of British architects to build pillared and pedimented country houses up and down the land, as well as whole classical city plans, like that of Edinburgh. To put it simply, they changed the way Britain looked forever. But while Palladio's drawings had a huge impact on the physical landscape, there are other less functional drawings in the collection that had just as big an impact on the mental landscape. Fantasy designs, impractical perhaps, but they still altered the texture of the Western European imagination. For example, with the Sydney Opera House by Jorn Utzon, most critics thought that Utzon's great shells were actually unbuildable, and it was actually his engineer, Ove Arup, who actually worked out how to make them. Where Palladio clearly followed in the logical, buildable Brunelleschi school of design, Utzon could be said to lean more towards the fantasy Leonardo school. Charles also let me see some of his currently unexhibited treasures, many of which really take you to the heart of the creative process, showing how architects have used different types of drawing to plan the different stages of their building projects, but also how, sometimes, they've simply drawn as a way of thinking or dreaming out loud. First of all, we saw some of the functional drawings. Here, here's one uh, you prepared earlier. Here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, three drawings by uh, an architect uh, called Colin Campbell. Here you've got a house which, in fact, he built down in Kent called Meribeth Castle, which is modelled closely on Palladio's Villa Rotonda in Vicenza. Those are beautiful. Is that, is that actually a drawing? That's a drawing, yes. It looks remarkably like an engraving. It does, doesn't it? It's, um, it's beautifully done it's in pen and, and gray ink and, and gray washes. Then came the bit I have to admit I'd been waiting for, a close-up look at some of the historical masters of architectural fantasy, the French architect Boulet and the Italian draftsman Piranesi. This is one of a series of etchings of fantasy prisons. It's a sort of nightmarish scene of... This is what Goya would have done if he'd been an architectural draftsman, these sort of dark fantasy images. They're absolutely fantastic. I mean, lots of sort of hurried, busy little lines. Very little detail. Everybody's sort of seen half buried in gloom and, and you can't really make much out about the figures except that there's a general air of sort of suffering and pain. Piranesi was an architect and stage designer whose greatest drawings were these architectural capricci, or caprices, this folios like a crazed romantic novel in picture form, unfolding in scene after scene of alienated pygmies dwarfed by vast classical structures. His drawings were created just decades before the French Revolution and looked like apt symbols of an absolutist regime that had to be toppled a dark, repressive Bastille that had to be stormed. Piranesi might have been a fantasy architect, but he remodeled the way people thought about their world. This is, if you like, a dark side of fantasy. Mm. If you go, think of this as basement stuff. Basement. And, <laughs> and then if you walk upstairs, then you come to something um, like this. This is Boulet, Louis Etienne Boulet. And you can imagine 
this extraordinary metropolitan cathedral. He thought of this as crowning the skyline of Paris. I mean, the scale is stupendous.